So let's deal with the other elephant in the room that I think a lot of therapists are, are struggling with and shy away from, which is the dreaded weight loss. My initial thoughts on weight loss is that therapists, mainly through the way they're, they're, they're taught, it's, they overcomplicate it. Because they overcomplicate it, they create their own fears around it because they're over, we've got a fly, because they're, because they're overthinking it. Um, because they, they start overthinking, they start worrying, so they shy away from it. They build it up into something that they're telling themselves that weight loss is complicated. I think it's actually far easier to deal with than many other things. I think it's I think it's a doddle compared to you know severe anxiety, for example. Well, I think actually with weight loss, you see, it's a bit like smoking. It's another thing you can fail on, big time. Yeah, you can actually fail on it, and the trouble is people's measurements of it. Um, once again, the public has a different perception of things, so they might phone you up and say, it hasn't worked, I've eaten a cake this morning. Yeah. You've never told them we can't have a cake. Yeah. Um, most people know what a healthy diet is, your clients know what a healthy diet is, it's just they don't adhere to it or we don't plan for it. You find that with weight loss clients, their planning is poor, they get home from work, they've had a busy day, they haven't actually planned out a meal, so they get on the phone to the local pizza company or the Indian takeaway or whatever. Um, and not all takeaways are bad for you. Yeah. This is my, I might as well chuck that in. But, yeah, everything in moderation. Um, but they come home, they think they're hungry. That's another misthought sometimes. Big plate, overactive thought, fork. Because they've got free Papa Doms with the Indian meal, they're going to eat them as well. A lot of it is just poor planning. Yeah. So I mean, with weight loss, you have to, I think, help them with, in various ways. It's not actually the diet. I mean, some, some people may find that they've got sort of a sugar addiction type thing, addictive behaviour. They like sweet things, and so once again, they don't really like the vegetables. So, um, and the trouble with that one is it runs off onto the children. Yeah. So mummy doesn't like broccoli, therefore kitty doesn't like broccoli, so kitty will reject the main healthy meal and have a treacle sponge or something like yeah. that, um, which is basically just all calories and virtually nil nutrition. So I think a lot of it is getting over the misconceptions. They're going to come to you and think, you're going to get your watch out, be all nice and sleepy, and now you hate everything that's bad for you. You only eat broccoli and steamed chicken, steamed which rice. Rice. yeah. <laughs> um, which, of course, people don't love broccoli and, ste and yeah. steamed chicken. Um, and there's no actual need to eat it. No. no they, that's what they, they sort of get into. But incidentally, I'm just trying something out and in fact actually anybody seeing this will know about it before even my crew back at home know about it. I've just organised booking a hall in a little village nearby mm -hmm. where very conveniently they have an ex-client of mine um, who is a personal trainer and runs various classes there and I've also teamed up with a nutritionist, a properly qualified ah, nutritionist. Right. Okay. And we're going to do a weight loss seminar on, I think it's the 12th of January, which is just sort of conveniently into the New Year's resolutions when everybody's has died. A great and flagging. A great time to hit the weight loss market. Uh, just a sort of time when the Slimming World and Weight Watchers, all their people are wandering in with virtually no underwear, diving in the loo beforehand, just to make sure yeah. that they don't put on a pound. All these sort of things. Um, but it's relatively cheap. There will be an early bird price as well. We haven't actually, it hasn't even been advertised yet, but it's been yep. booked. Because I sit there and think, it's something different. And yep. if it works, we'll be doing it quite frequently. Yeah. But if you can get 40 people in a room at 30 quid a go. Yeah. That's a no brainer. For a sort of four hour seminar there, I say, yeah. Me doing the therapy side, the and get rid of your issues and things like that. A nutritionist talking about what they already know anyway. Yeah. And the personal trainer perhaps showing them how to 
because that's another thing you see with with um some people their body doesn't actually know what their muscles are for yeah they, they can't that's true they can't possibly exercise they can't possibly go out and do the london marathon yeah but they've got to do a little bit of exercise just so that their body knows it needs the muscles yeah because the body will take energy it likes fat because fat keeps it going the body needs energy to live so subconsciously you need energy to live and of course that harks back to when food was scarce you know going back hundreds of years or whatever when food was scarce so when you've got the opportunity to eat as much as you can so that's in to a large extent that's that is our primitive brain actually actually working in our best interests in the yeah. commas so if you can have a nice big fat store which is just energy yeah it's good and if you're lying on the t on the settee watching the television all night yeah say the brain can say well i don't need these muscles i'll take the energy from there yeah which only goes into the vicious circle makes things even worse you haven't got as much energy haven't got as much yeah. muscle there to move you around so that's the reason for a personal trainer to just get people yeah. stretching exercising yeah i'm not uh, saying that people i mean but with weight loss you yeah. also have to look at the other issues they've got yeah is it pain yeah fibromyalgia CFE, um, so CFS rather. Yeah, <laughs> emotional pain. Is it emotional pain? Is it they have hang ups over certain food? Yeah. Is it, and very commonly in amongst weight loss people, when they were a kid, their parents made them finish the whole plate. Yeah. Which is a thing that comes from the rationing of the war because their parents had to yeah. finish the plate. Yeah, it's a generational thing. It's a generational thing. But the trouble is, if you look at a plate just post the Second World War compared to one nowadays, yeah, yeah, tough a size. See, I, I stay away from trying to motivate them to. Again, this is where I think it's easy to overcomplicate weight loss. I completely stay away from getting them to move, getting them to run about or anything. If they want to do that, I, I support them in that, but I don't encourage them because that's a massive bridge for a lot of people to cross. Lots lots of my ladies, you know, are, are literally, you know, 18 stone plus, you know, a good couple of hundred, yeah, couple of hundred Coming pounds. the door sideways. <laughs> yeah, li literally, literally. Um, so I actually stay away from getting them to move around. Because I, I read something years ago, and I, I, I'm probably getting this slightly wrong, but for for a twelve stone for a twelve stone man, I don't know why it was a man, maybe they just meant a human. For a twelve stone human to burn three hundred calories, they've got to run, and I mean run, not jog. They've got they've got to run for twenty seven minutes or something. So if somebody's got fourteen stone to lose or, or whatever you know some of my ladies are 20 20 stone plus and they, they are literally looking at losing 12 or 14 stone they would have to run for hours they'd have to mm. have one lettuce leaf a day and run for hours and hours which i think is setting them up to fail oh no they wouldn't do that but um they would fail yeah but the thing is if they show their body what the muscles are for, even yeah. if it's just walking to the shops instead of getting on one of those little electric buddies and yeah. buggies and mowing down children. Um, there, if it's just walking, it's actually telling your body, hey, I need, still need my muscles. Yeah. Um, there, and it's getting aerated because the, the thing is that if we're going to go into the science of it, people burn fat, uh, and I sort of like used to get confused when I was going to the gym you get on the old treadmill and it's got sort of a little chart that has your age on it and it has maximum heart rate so yeah. sort of like i don't know you're 30 years old and it's his maximum heart rate 180 and then it's got fat burning zone which is sort of like say from that age 120 to 130. yeah i always used to think well hang on a minute if i run faster than that i'm going to burn more fat off yeah but the trouble is when we say burn fat off, we're actually talking quite right. Fat is just basically a long string of carbon and hydrogen. That's all it is, yeah. a molecule. 
so when it is oxidized or metabolized properly, the end result, I know it goes through quite a few chemicals before it gets there, but the end result is water and carbon dioxide. Yeah. Water goes out one end, or in sweat. Yeah. Carbon dioxide, we breathe out. That's why we breathe out carbon dioxide. What we're breathing out, we're breathing in oxygen, which is yeah. now reacted with something, it might be carbohydrate, it might not be fat, and we breathe it out as CO2. And it takes something like 18 pounds of oxygen to metabolize fully one pound of fat. So what's happening on that treadmill is that you're elevating your breathing, but you're not diverting everything to the muscles. When you run yeah. flat out on there, the muscles are nicking it all. Yeah. Their, their energy, but it's not coming from the, the fat sources, apparently. Um, so a little bit of mild exercise. That's why we put the, because also we're playing into perceptions of our clients for yeah. this, this seminar thing, is that I've looked at sort of Slimming World, what have they got, what have Weight Watchers got, what has Cambridge Diet got? Yeah. Um, my seminar has got everything, I think, I hope, uh, there. But I mean, as you're quite right, that from a therapist's point of view, there's a reason why the subconscious has wrapped the person in a duvet. Yeah. Or kept the outer world at bay. Yeah. At distance. <clears throat> Trouble is that reason, there might be millions of them. It might be you're bullied at school and big is seen as good when you're mm. yeah. The bigger you are, the less yeah. likely you are to be bullied. I've had lots of um, lots of a good proportion of my ladies have had something bad happen to them. You yeah. know, they've been touched in the wrong way, you know, when they were young and they tell me straight they they want to be unattractive. Yeah, it's, you know, protection. If if I'm I had a lady actually say to me, it was quite quite emotional for me as well as her actually. She said, um, if I'm ugly, that won't happen to me again. Yeah. And they were her exact words. Because they, they they think as a child they can't do anything about the abuse, so they think if they make themselves ugly, the abuse will move on to somebody else because yeah. nobody's listening to them. Yeah. Um but it may be also that they've suddenly put on weight where they work, where they suddenly gained a small Hitler of a boss who's yeah. given them all sorts of grief. So subconsciously they've got bigger so that he's less intimidating or something. Yeah. Um, it could be, you could probably think up thousands of reasons yeah. why that. So that's, that's why where I, the therapy comes in, is yeah. to clear out. Yeah. And that's why I always start, um, session one for every weight loss client is the blueprint. So you get all, so that baggage is gone. Yeah. So you're kind of removing the excuses or drivers, whatever you want to call them, for the behavior. Then the behavior is really, really, really easy to deal with once you get rid of all that stuff. If you don't get rid of that stuff, you can play with food as much as you like. That's like, but that, that kind of comes back to as, as Graham Harvey defines it very, very nicely. That is playing with symptoms. Yeah. I mean, sometimes. Some, I, I do play with symptoms, I must admit, sometimes, in that I have had somebody where they've been a very good subject, doesn't work if they're not, Yeah. but the old skit of, from the stage hypnotist, um, where somebody's munching an onion believing it's an apple. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be going to the stage hypnosis side of things, but that program, you can change the words on. Yeah. So I have, in several instances with people, made chocolate just taste ordinary. Yeah. Or not, there's no interest in it. And they usually do that because most people, if they're of a suitable age, they can remember the rubbish chocolate we used to get for Christmas decorations or something. Yeah, it's like soap. It's bloody awful. Um, and actually, Cadbury's have done us a favour now because the Cadbury's cream egg no longer seems to taste the same. No, I think they've got not like when we were kids. Do you ever do it the other way, the other way round, where if, for example, a client says, you know, I'd love to eat vegetables, but yeah. I just don't like them. Do you ever do it the other, the other way around where the vegetables taste more like chocolate? Yeah, I try and um, I do that. I, mean, I do use your version with the island or whatever it is with the table with the food on it. The, the trapdoor and well, um, yeah, in the but shack. I mean, sometimes I've done one. I had a lady who had um, 
you, you uh, various things actually you, you sort of latch into something they say yeah. something they don't like sometimes i often ask people say will you give me something that you don't like it doesn't have to be food yeah and one person had a bit of an addiction for crisps and she said that she hated frogs and toads frogs and toads <laughs> How so, uh, did you manage to like you could connect that with, with well, the like, dislike well, of crisps? Well, I gave him a vision. Well, the toad, the markings on it, and the crisps are marked. And I said, there's a sort of crisp in the bowl there. And I gave him this visualisation of suddenly it's got these legs and hops towards it. And she literally, when I said, said that, when you, when you put that in, because um, you're just trying to link and anchor things into people's minds. But, yeah. but normally, yeah. I try and get people to actually experiment with vegetables. I say, we're so boring, you know. Our cooking cycle is on a fortnight at best. Yeah. Probably in most people's cases a week. Yeah. Um, and there's probably loads of things in Tesco's or Adsta, Aldi's or whatever, that you haven't had in, month, in years and months. Yeah. Why not go and revisit them or even experiment with them? Yeah. They've got two chances. That's very true. They go to... A they go to a two-acre Tesco's superstore and they buy the same basket of stuff every week. Yeah. And, you know, I, I try to get people interested in experimenting with things. Um, myself, I mean, I used to be 18 stone, close to 18 stone. Um, my wife, a little bit conscious of her weight there. What we've effectively done is we've swapped potatoes for another vegetable. Not all yeah. the time, but we have yeah. a Sunday roast of potatoes. But just throughout the week, we just instead of having potatoes and a veg or two veg, yeah, we've now got an extra one. Yeah. And it's like if I make a cottage pie or something like that, shepherd's pie, instead of potato across the top, I just use mashed sweet. Yeah. Or mashed turnip and carrots or yeah. something like that. And we just just made a simple little swap. Yeah. Which at the end of the day, let's face it, mashed potato doesn't taste much. Mash, yeah. To me, mashed sweet actually tastes yeah. far better anyway. See, that's an overt way of addressing the of addressing the calorie intake. That's just trying to make yeah. it interesting for people. Because the, yeah. tr the trouble is, if anything, if you don't make it interesting for them, don't care what it is, they'll fall off the wagon fairly yeah. quickly. Yeah. And so, yes, you can solve all their issues or something like that. But you've got to remember that while they've had those issues... They've developed a liking for pizza, for KFC, yeah. for absolutely Burger King, and all that salt and all that. They've actually developed a liking for it. So once again, you're t same as smoking. You're trying to take them away from something that they like, yeah, and start them doing something that they don't like. Yeah. So you've got to actually, I think, try and make it interesting. Try and make food interesting yeah. again. Try and make preparation not a chore, not something yeah. they do at seven o'clock at night when they get home in for uh, home that's, work. That's a big thing. It's breaking down some of the excuses <clears throat> that a lot a lot of my ladies are, are, are giving themselves. Uh, somebody said to me the other week, um, I don't have time. I, she said, I don't get home from work till seven o'clock. I don't have time to cook. So I drop my bags off and I go out for a takeaway. Now, that must take her 45 minutes to get a takeaway. You could cook something from scratch in 15. So, it's, yeah. you know, I, I just put that back to her and she was kind of... Well, sometimes you, know, you can do something. I know you can't do everything in it, but you can have a slow cooker. You just chuck everything yeah. in the morning. It doesn't really matter if you're a bit late or a bit early yeah. back. Yeah. Because um, I think you've got to look at what the opposition does. And who is your opposition? It's Slimming World. It's Weight Watchers. It's Light of yeah. Life. Cambridge Dark. Yeah. Cambridge Diet and Lighter Life, I don't usually have much opposition from. Yeah. They are horrendous. I've actually had a woman who lost 11 stone with Lighter Life, but her skin turned grey and her hair fell out. And then right. she put it all back on again. Okay. It didn't cover any issues or anything like that. Yeah. Um, there. Now, certain problems are people actually want to do it too fast. Weight loss should not be quick. You see, you've touched on something fast. interesting there because, and I think this is something that therapists need to get their head around and, and should explain to their their client. I think weight loss is fairly unique. That you know, if somebody somebody walks in with an emotional issue, whatever it whatever it is, um, they can leave forty five minutes later, and that issue is gone. 
but the client who walks in weighing 20 stone, you can deliver that absolutely perfect uh, first session and they're still walking out weighing 20 stone. Yeah. Um, getting them, it's getting them to make the first step of the, of and the they journey. St they still have a habitual method because human beings are patterned. Yeah. So you just shook hands yeah. with me. Well, what's <laughs> that four foot in the middle of a, a thing there? Yeah. But we're that's patterned right. and when the hand comes out, yeah. we blew that up. I mean, that's yeah. one of the reasons why the handshake induction works quite yeah. well at times. Um, people, uh, you're, you've got to break down a pattern and in many ways that's all the hypnotherapist ever does is breaks a pattern, it changes a pattern. Yeah. Um, so the person can come in with the issues, with the 20 stone, and go out minus the issues. Yeah. But that doesn't mean to say that they haven't gone without their pattern. Yeah. Because at the same that I mean, one of the little jokes I usually have with women is, I, I say about human beings working to a pattern. I say just the same as I know you put your knickers on before you bra this morning. Yeah. And I actually say that to women clients. I say, sort of, yeah, you're right. The things you get away with, I don't know. Well, it's only ever backfired once on me. Yeah. Because a woman actually said, I haven't got any knickers on. <laughs> we did this. Um, she actually said, it's, that's the only time it's ever backfired on me. Yeah. Because they sort of say, yeah, you're right. How do you know that? I was only like that. Yeah. It was dead easy how to yeah. know. Because they it's were taught how to dress. To, yeah. They were taught how to dress when they were a child that they didn't need the bra. Yeah. So the pants go on first. So the pants always go on first. So let's take a step back. So it's patterning for yeah. food. So let's take a step back and look at when the client first walks in, in the door. Because one of the things that I see with almost every weight loss client, maybe I'm just unlucky, is they don't tell, they don't tell me the truth because they're, they're embarrassed about what they're eating or the quantities or whatever. So they'll say, you know, that lady, one of the ladies I'm seeing at the moment um, is was a, quite a difficult nut to crack in the first session because she she basically you know it's that old cliche that she she lives on lettuce leaves and mineral water, but somehow she's got herself to to 21 and a half stone. So what I do with them is I get I go I say just wait there a minute and I go and get an empty chair and I sit the empty I sit the empty chair in front of them and I say right I want you to look at that chair now John um, because this, I, want, I want you to imagine that this is you sat in the chair and this this version of you that sat in the chair knows everything that you know so you cannot lie to John and John cannot lie to you and I want you to keep looking at that chair and so tell me what you would say if John who you cannot lie to because he is you Tell me what you would say, what if, if John in the chair said, what do you eat in a week? What would you say then? And do you know what? It cracks the nut every time. Often that, you'll often get a few tears there. Um, you'll get a few tears. But more importantly, you get honesty. The scales fall away from their eyes because it isn't, in my observation, it isn't necessarily that they're trying that they're trying to lie to me, it's that they're, they're, they're fooling themselves. They don't want to admit to themselves that they're eating a family bag of Mars bars a night or, or whatever else. I think else. sometimes some people genuinely don't even notice what they're eating. They're That's, just, that is you know. another very good point because something that, that I go through with my weight loss clients um, that I, I identify very quickly with them, and this is all first session stuff, uh, first 10 minutes stuff really is what I call hidden calories um, is the um, lots of my middle-aged female clients are drinking too much they're not necessarily aware that they're drinking too much that bottle and a half of wine you know oh a glass while I'm cooking and a, a couple of glasses watching tv and a, a glass before I go to bed they're doing that seven nights a week. They don't realise that with these, what I call, again, hidden calories, they could be adding 10,000 calories a week to their intake. Well, there's also, there's a lot of hidden calories in food because when the great fad for taking fat out of everything, fat-free, 
Yeah. Um, in came sugars. Yeah. Um, there. And you, even you've got silly things like um, the marketing of things. Yeah. Um, is so confusing to people. You see, you've got yeah. the Muller Light. If you take a full fat um, coke, can of Coke, not um, yeah. 10 and a half grams of sugar per 100 ml. If you look at a Muller Light yogurt, yeah. you've got about somewhere between 8.9, 9.1, somewhere around there, depending on the yeah. fruit flavour yeah. of sugar. And it's got a load of rubbish as well. It's yeah. got sweeteners in it and all sorts of things. Yeah. But it's got light written on the end. Yeah. So people actually... Yeah. It's the, 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 into, the marketing myth. Lulled into thinking it's healthy yeah. when it's really got more chemicals than yeah. Bin Laden had in his cave. Yeah. Um, uh, and we in Britain, for some reason, we don't read the labels. No. And I'm just as guilty as that because um, the sweetener sucralose, I didn't get on too well with. And so I do, still do a fair bit of sport. And um, what I used to do was have a recovery drink, which was protein and carbs. Yeah. yeah. And I used to get it from Waitrose on the way up to the sports hall. Just happens to be on the way. And they had a special offer. They had the high protein version. And so I thought, well, well cheaper high protein, might as well have that one. And I never read the label on that one. Yeah. And after a while, I got started getting sort of painful knees and ankles and things. And one of the side effects of sucralose is painful joints. And right. I looked at the bottle. And sure enough, was, yeah. Sure enough, sweeteners lurking in there. Um, but we don't. We don't often see all these things. And what people should really be doing, I think, is actually when they don't recognise a chemical, they don't know what it is, Yeah. look it up on Google. Yeah. Because you'd be surprised how many oh, of these terrifying. things, these things are actually quite nasty chemicals. Yeah, aspartame. You've got aspartame. Don't even get me started. Um, so, so the on... benzoate in the fizzy yeah. drinks. It's, it's yeah. about the only chemical that can make vitamin C look bad. Yeah. Uh, um, there, but it's in fizzy drinks and things. Yeah. So it is, but I mean, calories are not everything, but there are laws of physics, you see, that... Um, if you put more in than you use, you are yeah. going to get heavier. And the trouble with calorie counting, which a lot of my clients have sort of done some form of calorie counting is, and this is the bit that none of them ever tell you. Yes, you can roughly work out what calories are going in. Mm. But the question is, what comes out the other end? Yeah. Just going back to um, sweeteners, just touching on uh, mental health with, with my weight loss clients. Lots of them are really fed up. And the way, when I ask them why they're fed up, they, they, they'll say, I'm fed up because I'm the size I am, or I'm the weight I am. So then we go through what, what they eat and drink. And again, we use the empty chair technique to, to great effect. The scales fall from their eyes and, and then they start being honest with themselves. If they're honest with themselves, they can be honest with me. But one of the things that many, many weight loss clients are doing or people struggling with their weight is they'll tell me, I ask about soft drinks. What do you drink in the day? Oh, I only have, um, I only have Diet Coke. Okay, how many of those do you have? Oh, I'll have four or five. So there's all those links with mood. So, I, you know, I explain about the sweeteners to get them off the, the mental health roller coaster that they're putting themselves on and explaining to them that maybe the reason you feel fed up is because you're filling your body with depressants. Again, it's, it's all stuff that commonly people don't know. So they think they're doing the right thing when all they're doing is driving themselves into depression and anxiety as well as being 20 stone. It's just swirl, all swirling down the plug hole. Well, there is a nice theory that if you take something sweet as in form of sweeteners, whether it's aspartame or sucralose, isoprene K or any of those, the tongue tastes the sweetness, which sends the signal to the brain, hello, some sugar coming in, yeah. which causes the, the body to release insulin, which then finds it's got nothing to work on, so it has to create hunger to get something to balance out the in insulin. So people tell, ah. although they having less calories in their drink, 
they're getting the sugars from somewhere else. Yeah. Um, there's a nice theory about that. But um, there's also a thing, you see, with which comes back to their issues uh, once again, that if you don't control those, the other hormonal responses are going to carry on. Yeah. Um, I think there. And one, you have to make it very clear to women that they will have, well, not sorry, that's sexist, people, clients, <laughs> clients, yeah, that they will have bad weeks. Yeah. There will be a week that they put on a pound or two. I mean, yeah. just the natural monthly cycle for women, their weight can change by what? Yeah. Because it's just water retention. Yeah. A pint yeah. of water is a pound and a quarter. <clears throat> Yeah. When a pint of water spread about your body, you wouldn't even notice it. Yeah. Um, you know, and so when the people go to Slimming World, because they come to us last. Yeah. They've been to Slimming World, they've been to Weight Watchers and things like that. Yeah. They've gone, do, 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 yeah. Like that. I've tried Slimming World. I've tried. And, yeah. And very often with them, once one of the issues, you've got something else at play here, which we haven't mentioned so far, and that's the toxic goal. What? The toxic goal. The toxic goal. I'll be happy when I'm size 10. Yeah. Now, they got big, they felt various emotions and things, but they'll be happy when they're size 10. Yeah. So now a few things happen. They come along and see Slimming World, Weight Watchers, therapists. No matter what you do, you nearly always lose some weight in the beginning. So let's say they have a wonderful week, they lose five pounds. All right, we know it's not five pounds of fat, but yeah, it's starting them off. They're 20 yeah. stone, they're now 19 stone numb. Um, there. Are they any happier? No. They might be a little bit pleased with their thing for time yeah. being. But the problem is, the more they come down, a couple of things either happen. Either body decides to fight it, to subconsciously fight it because it's not happy. It's put a duvet around the world, yeah. away, away from the world for a reason, and now that duvet's eroding and it's feeling frightened. There. Or the happiness had nothing to do with their size. It's something else. Yeah. The old man's a bully. Or, yeah, you know, a million things. <clears throat> so they've got this goal that they will be happy when they hit a certain weight. And even in the unlikely event that they did get down to a size 10, because it is unlikely in this situation, but they really persevered, and a few people do, they get down to that thing, the goal hasn't been met. Yeah. So then the brain thinks, oh, I've done all this work and I haven't even got my goal. Yeah. What the? Yeah. Back it goes off again. It's because the goal is toxic. Yeah. They've related something to uh, that's not there. So um, what they've done is they've put their identity in being happy. They've put their all into it. I will be happy. It be my I'll identity. be happy when. Yeah. My identity is to be happy when <clears throat> this is met. Yeah. And the trouble is, it never is going to be met. Because the Onslow of old man sat there, the couch potato, in his vest, looking like a slob with his fag hanging out of his mouth and yeah. his pint of special brew there, he's still sat there. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I get you. And the that, toxic goal, I like that. The, the toxic goal is a, is quite a, um, a real breaker. Yeah. And the other thing is, you see a thing that, that's quite close to me that I didn't learn. All our industry is seen as sort of like the positive intention. You've got to have positive thoughts, positive yeah. this, positivity that. You can't have any negative thoughts, you know. I think that's garbage. It's shit. Oh, sorry. It's, it's rubbish. You can edit that. <laughs> um, a negative imagination will undo a positive thought any day of the week. Yeah. Or positive intention. Yeah. It's the imagination that drives the subconscious yeah and so I tell people to have positive imaginations if you're going for an interview don't you don't have a load of thought about what can possibly go wrong yeah well you shouldn't you shouldn't have a thought about have a imagine your interview of everything going perfectly right yeah 
yeah. imagine them asking the questions you want, you answering them perfectly, or whatever. Imagine, you know, that that broccoli and steamed chicken tastes nice. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's a stretch too far. Stretch, yeah. <laughs> stretching the bounds of credibility. Um, so let's move on to the actual therapy. What does the therapy look like? As I've said, my first session is getting them to be honest with themselves so they can be honest with me. Um, I actually don't, once that bit's done, for me, I don't really talk about food a great deal. No, because I, I think, I I think um, something else that that therapists need to, to, to realize is the actual, and I explain this to the clients, before, before you pick that fork up or eat those crisps or open the Mars bar, or the act of actually putting it in your mouth, before you get that far, you've made 10 or 15 or 20 bad decisions which lead up to that. And they don't realize that. They think it's all about eating. They fixate on eating. So it's, okay, so where, where do you buy the Mars bars? Oh, when I go to Morrison's on a sat Saturday. I said, okay, so let's let's look at that. So you go through the cupboards on a Saturday morning, you do your shopping list. You write Mars bars. That's your first bad decision. Then you get in the car and you drive into Morrison's. And at any time on that, on that drive to Morrison's, you could think, you could decide, in fact, not think you could decide, I'm not going to buy Mars bars, but you don't. So there's another bad decision. Several opportunities. Then you get out of the car at, at Morrison's, you get your shopping list off the passenger seat, you walk into the store, you get your basket. At any of these points, so you've got you've got 10 opportunities to interrupt that behaviour. Say, do you know what? I'm not going to buy Mars bars. But you don't do it. So you've... you've You've ignored 10 opportunities there to not buy Mars bars. Then you get to the confectionery aisle or to the till or wherever the Mars bars are and you pick the Mars bars up. That's another bad choice. The next bad choice is deciding to put them in the basket instead of putting them back, knowing the damage that they are doing to you. And I, I, I don't, dis I describe, <coughs> excuse me, I describe weight gain to the clients as damage. I don't flower up my language, right. the damage, the damage that those Mars bars are doing. Then you go to the till to pay for your shopping. You take those Mars bars out of your basket and you put them on the conveyor. That's a, a big opportunity missed to not put those Mars bars down, knowing the damage that they are doing. And again, I, I, then I start repeating the word damage. Then you, you go home, you put them in the cupboard, you come home from work, Monday night or whatever, you're sat on the sofa, you put the TV on, you think, I'm going to have a Mars bar. You could have decided not to eat the Mars bar, but you don't, so that's another bad decision. So we're up to about 20 bad decisions. Then you get up and go into the kitchen, you open the cupboard in front of you and the Mars bars. You could decide not to to eat the Mars bars that are doing you the damage, but you don't. So the point, the point of this is, and it has quite a lot of impact on them, it's making them realize that, the, that they fixate, and I think this is why a lot of weight loss fails, is because they fixate about what they're putting in their mouth without realizing that there are 10 or 20, literally 10 or 20 bad decisions that all have to happen before or to, to enable that person to put the Mars bar, the thing that's doing them the damage, in their mouth. That's well, a little bit like the smoker, isn't it? If I haven't got any cigarettes, they can't smoke it. Yeah. So they're making the decisions, but it's it just sort of happens. This is a sort of the subconscious effect. For some reason, it just sort of happens. They're patterned and they yeah. want to go into the cigarette shop or they want to go... They always buy Mars bars, so it's always on their list. So yeah. they always pick them up. And once again, it's a pattern of behaviour that needs to um, be chopped in there. But Absolutely. If, but having said that, if a Mars bar was the only bad thing they're eating in a day, yeah. and they're still 20 stone, probably better be looking elsewhere. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
but at the end of the day, it's all somewhere you're going to come back to the fact that it's due to an overactive fork. Yeah. Spoon. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, you're going to come back to that. Yeah. Um, so then that's when I think sometimes the therapy doesn't work so much as you have to actually give people a bit of help and advice in how they buy things or what they buy, what they eat. Um, so I think it's useful if you're in weight loss to actually know something about nutrition. You don't have to be a fully qualified nutritional expert or anything like that. But just actually sort of the planning, because it, in effect, if they're writing out a list and it's got Mars bars on it, they're planning to buy it. They're planning to eat it, yeah. which is worse. Yeah, Again, that comes back to those, that comes full circle, back to those 20 bad decisions leading up to them But it started, one. But it started with a list and a plan. Yeah. Um, there, and then it's gone downhill from there. Yeah. And it started badly, tailed off a bit in the middle, and the less said about the end, the better. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the thing that's doing them the damage. I've done some therapy sessions go like that. Yeah, <laughs> unreal. Um, so then I move on to um, then I, I just move on to the blueprint. Then um, that's my that's my first session. So there's very very little concentration on food. There's the con conversation about bad decisions. I use the empty chair to get them to be honest with themselves. I go looking for. The hidden calories so you know i'll ask them do you have a drink on the evening as well you know because it's easy that people you know they disregard that that bottle of wine they're drinking every night of the week and when you're pointing out that they're they're, they're doubling their calorie intake in a week and often you know they they damn well know this but as i say that they're, they're kidding themselves so i go through all of that then to clear out the emotional stuff to get rid of the baggage so that session two you're starting with a clean sheet I blueprint them and send them send them home very very rarely just doing that that bit of education and giving them a good clear out I can't remember the last time a weight loss client didn't come for the second session and they hadn't lost weight that's without doing, folks, that's without doing one of these overcomplicated weight loss sessions that you're all told you need to do. Well, see, I think also a thing that never gets told on these things. Every one of your clients is different. And that even comes to their hypnotic ability. Yeah. As we know, it's sort of five or 10% of population of what the industry lovingly calls the numbers. Would always call them that. It's a misnomer. And there's five or ten percent at the other end that are just a total waste of time, and there's eighty percent or so in in the middle that can do something and not. Now the thing is, also we're taught you can't hypnotise anybody against their will. Crap, you can. But that wouldn't be good marketing because you're now back to the thing, I can make you do something for Sven Garling. Absolutely, yeah. It would be terrible to tell yeah. that. You're then, in, you're then into, am I gonna but, bark like a chicken and cluck like a dog and tell, tell you all my secrets? Yeah, but yeah, that can be done with quite a few people. Um, there may be some hell of a resistance, but very often, you see, we're just sort of taught Many therapists are using basic inductions. They've got no idea whether the client is actually hypnotized or just playing along. You know, when they're, when they're sat there like this, they're nice and floppy, they're relaxed. Yeah, we're not gonna yeah, you know, yeah. go to stage show. A bloke dancing around, holding a broomstick, believing he's Elvis, he's not exactly relaxed. And no. he's got his eyes open as well. Yeah. So when somebody's relaxed like this and you say to them, just want you to imagine there's a couple of balloons on the end of your finger that fill them with helium and so your fingers and hands are going to get lighter and your hand's going to rise up. And I've even put the jerkiness in there. Yeah. That is done <laughs> fully consciously. Because the person wants me to do it. The therapist yes. thinks... And so you think this is something to do with my therapy, that I've got to yeah. put my hand up. Yeah. 
And all that is is, is establishing nine compliance. To, nine times out of ten, it's flipping impossible to really tell what you've got. Yeah. And it's even like IMRs. I've seen people sort of like, you know, that's yes, that's no, and they're answering, you know, do you do this, like that. That's not an idiom motor response. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's unlikely to be. And so I think very often we don't actually test the client enough. Common mistake that's made. Um, Because I like to really see certain things that perhaps you just loop it into a sentence so that they um, don't really get it as an instruction so much. Um, I remember doing a smoker and I wasn't quite certain whether this smoker was advertised or not. And I said, and I just can't remember what the sentence was, but I linked it to something that it was completely unlinkable, really. Um, and because of this, your hand will just float in the air. And it, very hesitantly, the hand went floating. I mean, I was carrying on doing a smoking yeah. process. My hand in the air, and in, in the end, I just sort of said to her, I said, okay, in a moment, I'm just going to ask you to open your eyes. You remain in the same state. Open your eyes now. And I just said, what's that hand doing up there? And she, she just sort of went, uh, um, uh, you don't know, do you? Sleep. That's all right. Um, there. Because if you have got a good hypnotic subject, then you can actually not break these patterns much easier. Some people are hard work. Some people you have to actually tell them what to do, give them advice out of yeah. their, their shopping list, even as you said. Yeah. But other people, you can just say, you no longer stick Mars bars on your shopping list. Yeah. The other and end of that scale. You've, you've got different ends of the scale, you see. So this is why I think weight loss, in some ways, there is no right script for weight loss. Yeah. There is no. You know, just what we put in the island is one or two things about weight loss. Yeah. But they're not written for every client. So no. Yes, they'll work with some others. You will have to change it completely. Yeah, it is back some in the field. Some people want help. It's like working out what your, what your client is doing right. Don't bother with it. Work out what also is going wrong. And, adap- and adapting. That's where you put your attention. That, see, that's, a, that's another thing. If... If therapists shy away from weight loss, they're never, they're never going to get good at it. If they shy away from smoking, they're never going to get good at it. I'm not suggesting that we are practicing on our clients. I'm not an advocate of that at all. I'm not suggesting that we, that we practice on our clients, but I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting, and that's kind of the purpose, part of the purpose of wanting to do these videos, is that people, they equip themselves with a generalized skill set for smoking. They equip themselves with a generalized skill set for weight loss, and they start with that, and they build on their own success. We're all qualified people. We've all done all sorts of courses. We've all, we've all seen you know, a million YouTube videos on a million different things to do with hypnosis. All of the information is out there for somebody to put their own package together. So I think the thing is that the therapist needs to cross their own bridge, to use that metaphor, the therapist needs to cross their own bridge and make a start because otherwise they're not going to learn those touchy-feely adaptive skills that you're talking about. Yeah, they learn from the cock-ups. Yeah. It's not going to be afraid to, um, this is the old saying, what is it, an expert has failed more times than a, yeah. somebody else has even tried. Yeah. Um, and this is very true that um, you know we've made more errors. Uh, somebody once told me you can't call yourself a hypnotherapist until you died on your ass at least, is the exact words. Yeah. Uh, ten times. Yeah. Well, time served. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. <laughs> but but it, see, I think the, the only thing... difference is it doesn't happen as often now. Yeah. Absolutely. But I would never say that it doesn't happen. Yeah. I can have. Funnily enough, I mean, when I, if I come back to smoking again, I just don't seem to be able to work with people that don't that smoke less than twenty a day. Yeah. And I don't take them on. I forgot. Yeah. You know, um, sixty a day. See, I've that's got interesting. Phenomenal success with. Yeah. Do you know? 50, I 50, 60. I experience the same thing with lots and lots of different issues that that clients bring into the room. 
that the worse their, their issue is, the easier it is to get rid of it really, really quickly because you've got something so tangible. You know, it's like, um, it's like, it's really easy to pick up a beach ball because it's that size and it's really difficult to pick up um, a speck of dust with a pair of chopsticks because it, it's absolutely minute. If you've got something big and tangible, there's a million things you can do with it. Yeah, really, not very long, a couple of months ago, I had a lady ring up and say she'd had something like struggling with her weight for 35 years. So most of this was booked up across email. So anyway, when she turned up, I actually sat, I said, she sat down and I said, I said, you know exactly what I'm expecting. And she sort of looked at me and said, well, what were you expecting then? I said, well, most people that tell me they struggled with their weight they come through the door sideways. She, yeah. was, she was size 16. Yeah. Which I think is the same size as Marilyn Monroe was, actually. Um, she wasn't that big at all. Yeah. But she said, but to her, because she struggled with it in her mind, she is. But I was expecting somebody to sort of like waddle through the door and yeah. avoid being wedged in it. As I've had one or two of those, mm. um, you know, and so got the perception completely wrong to start with. Yeah. What I was doing, all because she said she struggled for thirty five years. Yeah. And I had immediately taken that judgmentally yeah. wrong, as she was going to be bloody enormous. Yeah. And in actual fact, I should have been thinking, well, this is an easy one because you haven't actually got that much to lose. Yeah. But. Um, I find actually those actually far more difficult. Yeah, I've had one of those recently. She, she's a lady who's lost a lot of weight and she's, she's, um, she's quite a slight build. I would actually describe her, her as slim, but she can't, she's, she's getting really wound up because she can't shift the last, I think it was four kilos or something. Now I looked at her and I, my thought was, well, where are these four kilos? Without looking like you're ogling them, where are these four kilos? I couldn't see where these four, four kilos could possibly come from, but that's maybe harks back to what you said of, in part, a toxic goal. Yeah, probably is. If the goal yeah. isn't set right. She's telling you she's going to be happy when she's lost those four kilos. Yeah. But she won't be. Or yeah. 99% certain that she... Uh, yeah. Um, so what she's done now, she started, she started exercising in order that she can change her body composition and got, change, got, change got, her shape. Uh, <laughs> because for, for, for this lady, it's, it's, she's very elegant and it's all about appearance. She wears nice suits for work and that sort of thing. It's more about her shape than actually what she weighs. And she actually said to me, I wouldn't care if I weighed 15 stone if I looked nice. Yeah. So she started going to the gym, she started exercising, she keeps in touch with me, she's now got to where she wants to be, she tells me, that, and she actually, she only weighs a kilo and a half less than when she came to see me, but she's changed her body shape, she's tautened everything up a bit, and she feels absolutely fantastic. Now you see, one so, thing we haven't talked about, bloody gastric band. Oh, don't get me started on, I'm going to walk off. <laughs> well, the interesting thing is, you see, I don't do gastric band. No. Because, for a couple of reasons, I know people that had actual gastric bands. Yep. And it hasn't delivered what they wanted. How many of those clients have, uh, have a, we had? A couple of them are actually seem to be just as big as they were. Yep seem to be that by liquidizing their food they can still ram it in there yeah. um other ones have lost the, the physical weight as in on the scales but then they've got loose skin hanging everywhere um which of course there's a layer of fat underneath that skin stretches it doesn't go yeah. back it's one of the reasons why you should lose weight slowly to allow yeah. your skin to, to react because it's being replaced all the time. Um, the other danger is I know somebody that's had virtual gastric bands and I would class them, although they're not a client, they're just somebody I know, but I'd class them as anorexic now and they're still on about losing weight. Mm, they, eat, they eat 
they are there. The therapist hasn't kept in touch with them. They eat like a sparrow. Yeah. And I actually see quite a few... I'm not saying it doesn't work. I'm sure it, but it does. But I, I can see quite a few sort of like little pitfalls in it. And I don't see that it's necessary to go through all this sort of like acting of... Oh yes, I'm your doctor, and you're going to have this surgery, and like taking them all through the process. It's selling a. It's just. It's selling, to my mind, an unnecessary product mm. to people who who want to buy into a myth. So okay, there's the power of suggestion there that they've got. They've they've got this. Vir- I had a virtual gastric band, so I'm going to lose weight. So I'm going to. It just. I've looked at it. I can't. For me, I can't see. The, I can't see the benefits. It's overcomplicated. It's for me. It's it's just selling snake oil, and there's there's actually a much easier way. If someone wants their stomach shrinking, which is ultimately what they're looking for, if somebody wants their their stomach shrinking and somebody's in, insistent, I do it in a really simple way in a couple of minutes. Before I get them <laughs> into hypnosis, start waving my watch, clicking my fingers. Before the, the hypnosis starts, I say, okay, what I'd like you to do is just put your hand flat on your tummy, wherever their tummy is, and put your hand flat on your tummy, and just tense your tummy, and let it go. And just tense your tummy, and let it go. And just tense your tummy, and hold it, and let it go. And I want you to remember now what that feels like. And your tummy is tense and your tummy is getting smaller. Then in the session, I ask them to remember, I want you to remember now what your tummy felt like as your tummy was getting smaller. But I want you to imagine that that now intensifies and it gets smaller and smaller. So if your tummy is the size of a football, I want you to imagine that that football is deflating. I want you to remember, so you're building the association with that physical sensation, and I want you to remember what that felt like when you were making your stomach smaller. And I want you to keep deflating that football now. And I want you to keep deflating it, remembering that physical feeling of your stomach getting smaller. And I'm gonna stop talking in a moment And I'm going to let you continue concentrating only on that sensation of your stomach getting smaller. And I want you to nod your head clearly for me when your stomach is the size of a tennis ball. I stop. And I wait. And often you'll see them physically tensing up. I don't ask them to tense up. I only ask them to remember the sensation of when they were they me when they were making their stomach smaller so they're completely empowered to do it I like that. on their own so you know however long it takes 10 seconds two minutes five minutes then no, I, I just sort of see the things like gastric band as a complete rip-off you don't need yeah. to go there you don't even need to do the training no well that, that is literally all i do okay. all i do the, the thing that i then follow on from uh, with that is I do then go on to portion control. Yeah, I get them to look at their their their, their plates because this isn't a first session thing. So we've already dealt with um, the garbage that that they're eating, and often the other thing, obviously with weight loss clients, is even the healthy stuff they're eating that they're eating twice as much as they should. So we get the stomach to the size of a, of a tennis ball. Then we get them to reject all the food from the plate that isn't a healthy portion size and won't fit in your stomach knowing now that it's the size of a tennis ball, a healthy size, the size you need it to be in order to get to where you want with your weight loss goal. So those things, those two things go hand in hand. So in their in their mind, their their stomach is now the size of a tennis ball. They've got they're presented with a normal their their regular normal for them um, sized plate of dinner. They scrape everything off that won't fit into that tennis ball, and that's. 
that's generally a that's generally a session generally a session a session two thing that's all i do you don't you don't need the gastric band well, sorry, that's scraping stuff off i knew, i did want to write a, a book about diets called the dog diet the only problem was i never got past the one page because and the book doesn't really sell with one page but basically the advice was to get to get a dog put your normal meal on your plate then take 20 percent off to feed the dog and then take it for a walk afterwards so the dog didn't get fat <laughs> and so that is my dog diet which to be fair can can actually be done in one page it's just, yeah i just can't see it on amazon the, because no, the, the preview you'd given the book away yeah <laughs> actually probably have to write more for the preview than the book yeah. contained um, so but i one of the other things just for people watching this if they watch it if they do watch it the one that i really hate is actually the for, forever lying cleanse nine the who uh, forever living sorry i always call them forever lying forever <laughs> Le forever living is an aloe vera supplier right. and they do this cleanse nine product um which is a nine day cleanse cleanse is what well this is the question um because they're saying that you've got all your toxins in your body and this cleans them out they say, okay they say all the decayed matter sat in your intestine it's non-existent ask any colorectal surgeon and he'll tell you that the intestines clean themselves or are and clean but now this cleanse nine. So for three days you tip, tip this rather nasty tasting aloe vera juice, pulp, whatever you want to call it, in. That's your food. Now, the aloe vera stuff is a mild laxative. Okay. If you had the green leaves, it'd be a major laxative. The, yeah. The pulp in the middle contains a little bit of it. Mild laxative. After the three days, you then have this sort of milkshake diet, mm -hmm. uh, restricted to, I think it's 1,200 calories a day, at very slow. Um, so what you're doing is you're tipping a mild laxative in for a few days and then having a horribly restricted calorie-controlled diet. And you will lose somewhere around about eight or nine pounds in those nine days. Yeah. And you actually feel that. Yep. nine pounds off your weight you will feel so you think you're going to feel wonderful now the question is firstly what have you actually lost you have somewhere in the region of depending on your size four to five pounds of bacteria alone in your intestine yeah um you actually have more bacteria cells in your intestine than you have cells in your body you just purge them out the back door now the unfortunate bit of that is, for later, they make up a very large portion of your immune system. They stop other bacteria getting a hold. Okay. Like that. So it's funny actually, it's interesting to note that you see these people that have done this cleanse nine and the next thing you see is they've got the flu or some lurking. Yeah. Hmm, maybe a coincidence there. But you've also been heavily restricted to calories. So having got out, you think your intestine is, a small intestine is about 21 foot long, a large intestine colon is about six foot long. And at any one time, it's basically full of stuff. Yeah. That you just basically purged it out. Yeah. There. So yeah, you've lost a load of weight. Um, but you haven't really lost any fat or anything. Yeah. You haven't actually cleansed it. I've asked people. But as soon as you go back to solid food, your gut's going to fill up again, and the weight goes back goes on. back on. But I've actually asked people, both members of um, uh, you know salespeople and actually quite high up, to give me the biochemical method by which any toxin is removed. Because let's face it, the trouble is we talk about toxins. Toxicity is by dose. If you take something very toxic, say foxglove, digitalis, yeah. in very small doses, it's a heart medicine that is beneficial for people with heart problems. <laughs> right. Anything above that, it kills you. Yeah. And that is basically the same for everything. If you take enough salt, which you need to live, yeah. Yeah. it kills you. Um, if you actually drink too much water, that's very true. It will kill you. Yeah. See, so toxicity is always by dose. And if you were to suddenly release all these 
toxins in your body at once, yeah, it kill you anyway. Mm. Um, there you see. So I'm not saying. I mean, this is sometimes where some bits of hard to shift fat get because the liver, if it can't deal with something, yeah, that's new to it, yeah, a like preservative or something like that, it will buffer it or wrap it up in fat where it can't do any harm. Uh -huh. So sometimes yeah. you do find a sort of rib round here that's a bit difficult to shift. Um, and yeah, that does take time to go because you've got the, the liver's job is basically to take anything that it doesn't like and convert it to something that it does like. Yeah. But since man was developed, there are thousands of chemicals now that are basically alien to earlier man. Yeah. That we've had to evolve to look after with preservatives and things like that and um, processed foods and processes. So, yeah, but the Forever Living Cleanse 9, about 120 quid. Wow. Um, and people <coughs> say it. But you see, talking so about it's, selling. It's pet hates, you see, because it's yeah. being sold and people saying, well, I lost nine pounds in nine days. Yeah. They don't go back to your fact that you're 12 stone bloke with trying to burn 300 calories yeah. was on that treadmill for quite a long time. Yeah. Um, it takes a lot to burn that yeah. many calories. And yeah. Things. So um, there, there are no quick fixes. And that's one thing we have to get across to clients. That if they lose it too fast, they'll only put it back on again. Yeah. And basically, if somebody says, well, I lost 10 pounds that week, I probably did, but it basically wasn't ten pounds of fat. You've touched on something else there that that I cover with with uh, as I call them my my ladies, um, which is I, I ask them how much would you like to lose each week, and the ones who are most content and and most successful long long term I do keep in touch in touch with them in case we need to get them back and do any tweaks or if they're falling into an old bad habit or a new habit, replace it with a new habit or anything. Um, I suggest to them that if you if you can lose two or three lose awful word if you can lose two or three pounds Shit. each week, you're doing really well. You're doing really well. If you lose one pound, you are still moving yourself forward. And they'll often reply. Oh, I, I need to lose more than that. I want to, you know, bear in mind a lot of my ladies are 20 stone plus. Um, oh, but that's going to take me, that's going to take me uh, a year. So I say, okay, well, if you, if you want to lose more, you know, you know what to do. Eat less, stop buying the Mars bars. It's all cause and effect. Whatever you put on your plate is going to affect how much you do or don't lose. But please remember that even if you lose one pound, only one pound in a week, you are still moving yourself forward. Because some of them, have come again, this is just from having done it for years, experience showed me that, that they would often get demoralized if they only lost a pound. And then if they'd only lost a pound for a couple of weeks, they start to feel like it's not worth it. And then they start eating again. They fall off the wagon. So these little bits of education make help ensure that the weight, the weight loss journey, as it's often described, is successful long term. But it's the, they're not going to get this is why you fits. see Weight Watchers and Slimming World fail. You get person, it's back to the old NLP, we move away from pain move towards pleasure. Yeah. So somebody gets to a weight up here, which to them is a pain. It may be an emotional pain, it may actually be physical pain, because it may yeah. be impacting on joints, so it doesn't matter. It's all pain, brain pain. Yeah, they, they make a decision. I've got to get rid of some of that weight. So they go to Slimming World, they go to Weight Watchers, like life anyway. And initially, they tend to lose quite a few pounds in the first week. Yeah. And so the graph starts to come down. And then you get this horrible plateau thing. Yeah. It slows down and they hit a plateau where it's even difficult or even bloody murder for them to actually maintain the same weight. Yeah. Let alone come down. 
So that's why they're all going off to in the middle of winter, in the middle of January, and you see all these women in sort of like basic crop top, no bra. They've got a, a skinny pair of leggings on with nothing underneath that. They're sat in the loo beforehand and they come out. Oh, thank Christ for that. I didn't, didn't put any on. Yeah. And once again, the focus is on, I didn't put any on. No. Yeah. Oh, I didn't. Yeah. Not a pound lighter. No. Yeah. I didn't put any on. That's where the focus is. I didn't put any on. And so the problem now is we were up there. We are down there. Yeah. But which, what's the pain now? The pain is now on the diet. Yeah. And we move away from that. So we give up going to Slimming World, Weight Watchers or whatever. And yeah. Back it goes again. And that's your weight. Uh, yeah. And that's because you, they never addressed the problem in the first place. Yeah. They've only addressed, like you say, the symptoms. They haven't addressed the underlying causes. Yeah. And that's the bit you can't emphasize enough. I get through to people. Well, I actually sometimes give them. I, I've got some sheets of graph paper squared stuff and I put pounds up one side or kilos yeah. if we're going to be metric and weeks along the bottom and draw a line down it and my line actually goes through I draw, I draw a green line through it usually one pound per week yep yeah. down the graph and I draw a uh, red line at half a pound a week yep yeah. Okay. And I say to people, you start here, you put your, you get on the scales, you put your scale in, you're starting here, this is week one. Your aim is to stay below the green line. Mm -hmm. So if you lose three pounds in the first week, and then you lose a pound, and then you lose two pounds, and then you lose one pound, and so forth, and then you put on a pound, you're still well below the green line. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Because you might have been to a wedding, you might have been on holiday, you've been on a cruise. Yeah, had a night uh, out. You've, had to, you've got to be quite a bit below the green line if you've got the cruise. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, yeah, you, you don't want to go to a wedding. You've got to come into the people, the social side of this. You don't want to go to a wedding and say, oh, it's a nice buffet, but where's the celery? Yeah. Um, yeah. You're going to have a little bit of nice stuff and a bit of pavlova afterwards or something like that, you see. So and you've got to allow for that. But once again, that's normally in planning in that... The thin person will plan for that weekend where they know they're going to have about 5,000 calories instead of their usual two or two and a half. Yeah. Um, they're, so they'll either have a bit less before the big day or after the binge instead of eating the two and a half thousand calories or whatever, they, yeah. they eat 2,000 for a few days and they'll just balance it out. Whereas the other type of person will just have the big binge. Yeah. every so often and not balance it out yeah so they'll gradually yeah go the wrong way um <coughs> thing mm -hmm. with weight loss but one of one of my fails and again if you don't start doing weight loss therapy you're not going to overcome your own hurdles as a therapist and remember it's a really really good revenue stream it forms a major slice of my my um income um, one of my fails, and I don't mind telling people about my fails because it's all a learning curve, was a lady came to me years ago and her thing was biscuits. She said, I've, always, I've got a cupboard on the kitchen wall and it's always full of biscuits. And I'll sit and I'll eat packet after packet after packet after packet after packet. Um, so in my naivety as a newly fledged barely formed <laughs> therapist, I barely have feathers and my eyes had only just just opened. Um, I dealt with the biscuits. Wow. Um, what was it she didn't like? She couldn't abide eggs. So in my naivety, as this newly fledged therapist, the biscuits predictably now taste and smell of eggs. Anyway, she called me it was an afternoon session. She called me that evening and she said, oh my God, that's amazing. She said, as soon as I opened the door to my house, I could smell the eggs in the cupboard in the kitchen. She said, and the eggs smelled so bad that I was, I was gagging. The, the biscuits, obviously, sm smelled of eggs. She could smell them when she opened the door to her house. So the hypnosis worked, fantastic. So then she, um, she emptied the cupboard, 
she put everything in the wheelie bin, she squirted the biscuits with fairy liquid washing up solution, closed the wheelie bin, went back in the house, cleaned all the cupboard out to get rid of the smell of eggs. I thought, in my naivety as a newly fledged therapist, I thought, this is fantastic, I'm really, I'm really good at this. However, because in my naivety, I haven't dealt with anything else. None of the underlying, none of the surrounding, none of the education, none of the feedback from assessment, none of the getting the scales to fall from their eyes. Uh, so she called me the next day and she said, it hasn't worked. I said, what hasn't worked? And she was very honest. She got out of bed at three in the morning or something, went in the wheelie bin, got some of the biscuits out of the wheelie bin, washed the um, washed the fairy liquid off, and she said, although they still stank of eggs, they'd been in the bin covered in fairy liquid. She, she washed the fairy liquid off and she forced herself to eat the biscuits. I had no idea what to do. I had absolutely, what a massive fail because I hadn't done any of these other things that we're talking about. I mean, these days, if somebody wants to reject a specific food, I don't deal with it because there are always other things that, that they're eating. So for that, I go straight to the trap door and well in the shack on the island. You're there in front of the table. The table at the moment is empty, but I'd like your subconscious mind to fill that table with any or all of the, the, the foods or drinks um, that have led to your weight gain. And the table becomes full, and when the table's full, tell me. All the food and drink, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, this is the short version. If you've got the island, you've got the full version. Then everything goes down the well, the bottomless well. So everything goes down the well under the trap door. Then, so I don't know what's on that table, but if there's anything else that they haven't told me about, they know it goes on that table. So they don't even have to have told me. They may not have, even after all, all the other work, they may still not have told me about something or, or often they've genuinely forgotten about something. This is why when I do the trapdoor and well for, for weight loss, when they've emptied the table, I send them back to the table. I say, now, I want you to have a really good look now. Look under the table, look behind it. Maybe there's a cupboard on the wall. Look in the fireplace, look anywhere. If there's a chair, look under the, look under the rocking chair, if I've used the rocking chair with them, which I use for most clients. And do you know what? I've never had a client who hasn't found something else. I had a lady a few weeks ago um, who found... She said, at the end of the session, she said, oh my God, I've completely forgotten about midget gems. Midget gems, of all things. And at work, on the reception desk, there's one of these charity boxes, get a bag of sweets for a pound. And she'd forgotten that every morning she puts a pound in, takes a bag of midget gems and eats them, eats them through the morning. So always, I always send them back to look for anything for anything else and sure sure enough they always find something i said and I, but i also say to them or you may find even more of what you think you've already rejected so they might find another pizza or whatever but I, you know i really i really labor it just like with um with with alcohol i send them i send them looking for any other um, alcohol yeah, the hidden stuff I actually yeah do, I actually do that with Graham's clearance protocol in the library yep I say go and look around there's some other rooms there's maybe a cellar or something like that and go and find the stuff um yeah I thought that was quite useful to go back people tend to gloss over it a bit too fast yeah and so I send them off to I actually put all the good food on the table as well as all the bad food do you yeah. And they have to go and fish out the bad food. And I did this recently with one that um, did have a bit of a chocolate addiction. And we'd already basically changed their attitude to chocolate because I got her onto the, let's say the young people won't understand this, but many years ago, when you used to get these Christmas decorations and things, the chocolate just, if you're a Cadbury's fan or a Galaxy fan, yeah. this was crap. It was horrible. 
and it was quite an old lady. And I actually sent around, she hadn't around everything, and I said, now go back to the table with the good stuff. And I said, a lettuce leaf seems to have fallen on the table, and if you pick that up, there's one last bit of chocolate under there. And I want you to actually taste that. Because what's happened is, that lettuce, that flavour has been absorbed into the lettuce leaf, and it, now that chocolate tastes absolutely horrible, like one of those old Christmas decorations. Yeah. And I taste it. And you can see her screw her face up. This is um, there. I said, but the nice thing is, now the lettuce leaf tastes great. Very nice. I have a chomp of a, of a lettuce leaf. But I'd actually, the last thing that was hidden, I mean, obviously, if, if chocolate isn't their thing, it wouldn't really work with these sort of things. So, so you've got to adapt it. But there was just one last piece that she hadn't found because I'd, I'd hidden it specifically for her. Yeah. Uh, then she'd gone off in there. But that was the bit that I was going to make taste horrible. Yeah. But it was under what I also wanted to take it taste good. So yeah. I sort of said, I like that. Funny thing is, because you see in the imagination, physics doesn't apply. This is a great thing with the island. Physics doesn't apply to it. No. Geography doesn't. Pure, ima to, pure uh, imagination. Pure imagination. I said to people, you know, if you want to have a field of rainbow coloured unicorns, absolutely fine. Yeah. And I often use the phrase that I got from somewhere else. I say, hypnotherapy and hypnosis works on imagination. Yeah. And the trouble is, when we're born, we've got unlimited imagination. Then gradually, we swap imagination for experience. Mm -hmm. I no longer have to worry, uh, have to think about or imagine what getting hit on the favourite toy with a hockey ball doing 200 miles an hour is yeah. like. I know, I've had it. Yeah. <laughs> I've got experience. You don't have to imagine what stubbing your toe would be like. Yeah. You've done it. All these sort of things. And the trouble is, we start, as we get older, I think we, many of us lose imagination. I say, what I really want is I want you to have the imagination of a four-year-old boy wearing a Batman T-shirt. And if you can do that for me, you're going to be my client. And if I can get them round to that, <laughs> yeah. you imagine a four-year-old kid wearing his Batman T-shirt. Yeah. He's got all the imagination, all the imagination that the any hypnotherapist would ever could need. Ever. Ever need. So, so, so I say to people, I want you to have that imagination. And I sometimes do things with them. I, I test their imagination, see how, right, so with the island, it's only limited by your imagination. And so if you want to have rainbow-coloured unicorns prancing around the place, fine. Do you want to do this? Oh, someone said to the women, if you want to be carried around by Brad Pitt or George Clooney, fine, it doesn't matter. I had a lady who was a semi-professional skier. And so I, I asked her, I explained the island briefly, said, we're going to, we're going to take you to, a, to an island. It's your island. It could be anything you want it to be. And my, my, my single brain cell fired off. I said, so, would you like it to be tropical or, or winter? And she's, she's a skier, so she went for winter. So her island was, you know, covered in snow and had a ski slope and, and, and everything else. It, it, it's, that was her, that yeah. was her belief system. So work with your client's belief system. If it ain't broke, don't try and fix it. A couple of things I wanted wanted to touch on um graham's mirror i use i use graham's mirror uh from the clearance protocol if you haven't got it get it yeah i've got graham's mirror in inside the shack yeah oh it's you put it in the shack i put it in front ah, of the rocking chair brilliant. right at the end ah uh, okay. I, I sort of say you didn't notice this before or something like that but in front of the rocking chair I don't call it Graham's mirror. Yeah, <laughs> <It's all> Graham's <laughs> that's Graham's mirror. <laughs> yeah. Who the hell is Graham? It's, a, it's a good job his name is Alice, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the fuck is Alice? <laughs> um, yeah, I put the mirror in there just as it's sort of like getting to the end of things. Once again, the only reflection you see is the perfect you. Yeah. Which always reminds me of sheep for some reason, but... That's another story. God. <laughs> Might be the Welsh... Uh, awful eighth word thing. association. <laughs> Perfect you. Um, eighth Welsh. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I do that. I do use that mirror quite a bit from the yeah. protocol. Um, 
don't even know if it is from the Quotas protocol, but, but it's, yeah. it doesn't matter. No. Um, yeah. And usually it will come right before my exduction. Yeah. And bringing them out. Absolutely. That's it. I use it up at the end. I think the, the other thing that I wanted to touch on, see what thoughts you've got, is future pacing. I think that's often used really, really badly in weight loss because I think it's often, as we know from the blueprint, it's it's an incredibly powerful lever for the subconscious mind. But what I I remember when I was was learning, doing my training, well, I'm still learning, but when I was doing my training and we did weight loss, future pacing was on the end. And you know, with hindsight, all that was putting it on the end was um, really it was convincing the client's conscious mind that that this is how you're going to look. It's almost with hindsight, it's embarrassing because it's almost like saying, "Oh, I don't think I've delivered a really good, a very good session here." But this is how you're going to look, Sandra. I mean, what do you future pace them? Yeah. Um... Because I, I think that ties in really well with the mirror. I, I future pace them in the same session that I finish with the mirror. No, I probably don't, or that's a blooming good idea. That's why I like this thing. <laughs> uh, I do use a future pacing as I say, in the blueprint, I use it as the beginning. Yep. Um, trouble is, I alternate quite often between the blueprint and the clearance protocol. Yep. And I also sort of like. It's the blueprint in effect, or the clearance protocol, but with different words, you see. I, yeah. mean, I, th I think in the island we've got the, the garden. Um, yeah. The garden with a load of weeds in it. Yeah. Because I get quite a few people, because I live largely in the countryside. Yeah. Um, they like their plants, they like their gardening and things like that. So yeah. with them, you see, it's not birds in the trees, it's not paper boats. It's thistles and dandelions sat in what should be a nice flower bed, and then it's put the proper seed, get it all out, put the proper seeds in, and make those seeds grow, seeding the imagination and watering it and chucking some manure on it and, yeah. and this sort of stuff. Um, so uh, this is why I like the versatility of the island. That, yeah. Um, I don't have to sort of like say, oh, well, they like. They like their daisies and things, but they don't actually like birds. Oh, stuff, blueprint. Yeah. What, how the hell am I yeah. going to do that? Or Absolutely. Clearance protocol, you know. Yeah. I mean, at my school, we actually had the cane. The place, uh, you know, we can't have that these days, but well, yeah. we used to have a cane. Quite often it was administered in the school library. Right. So that could have some nasty connotations. Yeah. Once again, and this is... Um, you know, Graham would be the first to say to me, well, don't use a bloody library then. Yeah. Um, but yeah. he's got experience, so you wouldn't there. So it is sort of like, you've got to find out a little bit of, I know you're going to work content free, but you've got to know a, bit, a little bit about your client, or yeah. perhaps the age. Um, I can remember many years ago when I was in insurance, uh, watching my sales manager try to sell a Japanese unit trust to an old World War Japan prisoner. <laughs> Funnily enough, the guy had a lot of money, we could have made a lot of commission, and we come out with zip. <laughs> um, because he didn't think. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. The yeah. connotation, you see. So, yeah. as I say, the library normally. 99 times out of 100 would be absolutely fine, mm. but there are some circumstances where it might have yeah, um, yeah, bad feelings. But it's going, going, going into, into a violence. church, yeah. you know, you might have an altar boy that's been abused. See, that would be my idea of hell, because I'm divorced. I don't want reminding of going to a church. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so there are, and sometimes you, sometimes you fall into these traps. It's all about making these mistakes, gaining yeah. experience. But usually, if you're watching your clients, yeah, they've got eyes shut. You will start. To... Realized something wasn't quite right there. Can you tell me what I've done wrong? You know, a bit of humility because, goes a long yeah, way. Yeah, because we've yeah. got twenty ways of doing this. 
but I've just got the impression that I've hit a raw nerve or something like that. Yeah. And it might be something to, something very deep in the therapy that he's brought back. You can always go back in again. Yeah. Um, or you can sort of say, well, actually, because when they sort of say, yeah, I went to this public school and this bloke used to be so accurate with his cane, I could have six of the best and come out with one stripe on my bum. Yeah. Bleeding. Yeah. And it was administered in the library. I hate the blooming places. Yeah. Or I can't read. Yeah. Yes. I've never learned to read. Yeah. I don't know what, really know what I like. There's going to be circumstances for everything where something won't work. Yeah. And, and that's the and don't worry about don't worry about getting it wrong. Oh. As you as you as we've said earlier. If you watch your client, I mean, one of the funniest ones I've had, and I'm sure she won't mind me telling this because nobody will identify it. Then, um, happens to be a friend of mine, but isn't on there. I actually experimented with this a lady. She was somebody who was quite interested in hypnotherapy and stuff. And when I learned the swan, she was my practice guinea pig. Mm -hmm. And anybody who knows the swan, we normally use the left hand because it's connected to the right side of the brain. And she was a very good swanner. She was brilliant at it, in fact. But she had some weight issues. She also had a lot of issues in the past that even I at the time didn't know about there and we're talking really at the extreme end of abuse this person really yeah. at the extreme most people will be thinking what's extreme and they'll only be halfway to this one yeah um they involves rape and attempted murder of a child <coughs> yeah um and so i thought right we're in serious mode now therapy got a left hand up like that and it did absolutely nothing really puzzled me. She'd been fantastic a couple of weeks before, you know. But what I noticed as I was asking for to get a step <coughs> in the unconscious to move, she's got a hand sat there like this, but this was going on. Mm -hmm. And anybody watching this, just checking now, they can see it. Her right hand was moving. And so I swapped hands. And the funny thing was that when it was serious, I always have to speak to the right hand. When I was playing, for some reason, I don't know why, left hand will be perfectly all right, as long as we're not, as long as we're practicing all like that. But the right hand, all of a sudden, yeah, this all got very active. Came How out peculiar. The signals from the subconscious. Um, there. And so the thing is, is sometimes with this, if you just watch your client, sometimes when they're sat there like this, you'll suddenly see a finger trip off. Or, yeah. And like that. And the great line, once again, I think this one comes from Edel Ledochowski, Le as far as I know. Um, probably doesn't, but he's the one I think that what's happening now. That is a really good point that you've hit on there. I I don't believe I, I was basically taught as I think as I think the majority of people are, that in a session the, the client sits there and passively receives whatever therapy you fire at them. Um, and I completely disagree with that. I ask mine questions. Well, every movement is associated with a neurotransmitter. Every thought also yeah. associated with a neurotransmitter. Yeah. So if you're getting them to think about something like that and something's tripping off the thing, I mean, we all know about the rapid eye movement under the eyelids yeah. and eye flutter and things like that. But you'll get facial twitches and things like that. Yeah. They're processing something. Yeah. It might be useful sometimes if you knew what they're processing. Yeah. Now, I can understand somebody will say, hang on a minute, we're going out of the bounds of content free here. Mm. Well, we could be. Mm. Doesn't matter. Doesn't. Because it may well be something that's completely off the wall compared to what they're actually come to you for that you wouldn't have actually guessed in a month of Sundays. So no, now, I had a lady say to me, who she was processing quite a lot. She was on the island. I can't rem can't remember where we were on the island, and she was processing quite a lot. So I let her let her process. You know, all the twitches and ticks, and she was just about just about break dancing, <laughs> showing my age there. And um, once she started to settle, I said, "Tell me what happened there." She said, "My dead dad." came to see me. Now you'd never know that in a million years. I didn't know it. 
good dad. I'm not clairvoyant. So, but if you don't ask, so obviously then, you know, once, once the session was done and I, and I followed up, I said, you know, is, is your dad, is that something that, that you need to deal with specifically? Like you say, it doesn't matter whether we're working content free or not, as long as the client gets their outcome. So then she came back and I used the, I used the bereavement session from the island um, and she got her, her resolution. But if I hadn't asked, so apart from anything else, the two good things there, one, the client got their resolution. Two, I got more business out of it. Yeah. I filled my diary. But movements, they give away an awful lot. I mean, you shouldn't be afraid to say what's happening. I mean, I mean that the ultimate is street, extreme. Of course, you've got the ab reaction. And if suddenly tears start streaming down their face and so forth, then you know you've hit something raw. Um, Do yeah. you interrupt an ab reaction? Not usually. I, no, usually, I, don't. I, I usually just say, I, I, I let them have time to have the app reaction, let it out. Yeah. It's been in there a long time. Yeah. Just let it go. Yeah. Um, Encourage them to do really occasionally, well. Occasionally we'll have to take them off to the safe place for a time, but then we've got to go back to resolve it. Yeah. Anyway, but they can go back in a more dissociated form. Yeah. If they want to. But um, I mean, I've never actually had an ad reaction with the blueprint. I have a couple of times with the clearance protocol. Yeah. But the interesting thing there was that the clients actually caught themselves out. Um, funnily enough, I had two in the same month, very close to each other, with exactly the same thing that they caught themselves out on. Although they weren't related or anything like that. They were both women. They both ticked no on my sexual abuse question. And they said because they didn't think it was relevant and now they understand it was. And I've got no reason right. to think they were lying. I don't yeah. think they, yeah. they were lying. I think they genuinely believe it was so many years ago it couldn't be the cause of this. Yeah. But as I said to them, I said, well, now you know, because like it's in the clearance protocol, the, sub the subconscious is given the free hand to put up what it wants. Yeah. It so can't is... put up your entire life in that library. It puts yeah. up what's important. Exactly the same as on my cliffs. Yeah. It's not going to put up every person that's caused you a scratch or anything like that. Mm. It's only going to put up the un basically the unresolved stuff. Yeah. And so it's like with the cliffs. This is not in the island bit. Um, I don't think it, I actually now call the cliffs the karma cliffs. They put, when they yeah. go from the sort of meadow going up the hill. Towards the cliffs, there's a little wooden sign that says Karma Cliffs pointing that way. And people, yeah, they throw them off the cliffs. And I asked them afterwards, was there any person up there that you wouldn't have consciously expected? That's a great question. And so if they say yes, I said, well, obviously your subconscious knows something about them that you don't consciously. You better watch them. Could well be somebody stabbing you in the back. Um, and I also ask, is there anybody that consciously you would have thought would have been up there that wasn't? And my explanation for that, mm. if that comes up, is you've already dealt with them. That's nowhere we need to go. So that yeah. might be the person that, yeah. that when you're eight years old used to sort of like nick your cap and bat you around the head when you were like, yeah. in the bus queue and bully yeah. you. But that person might be dead now, gone elsewhere, you're never going to see him. Yeah. Um, you know, a bit like Biff in Back to the Future. Um, yeah. Then... Of course, the, the cliffs. I've also used used the um, used the cliffs because um, I've had somebody in in the shack already, and afterwards she said, "I thought that shack was really creepy." I haven't described it as creepy, obviously, but in her mind, the shack was creepy. So next session, um, I took her to the to the cliffs, and. I let her throw off, I said, in front of you is a, a big tub, you know, instead of the table, there's a big tub and in there is everything, blah, 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 all the food and drinks that you don't need and incorrect portions and all the stuff that's been harmful to you, that's done all the damage, which is why you're here today to resolve. And she had great fun. I said, you're going to really enjoy throwing all those things off the cliff. So she stood behind the railing. I said, you can't fall over because there's, a, there's a, 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 an iron railing that goes all the way across. 
I said, but you're going to really enjoy throwing. And immediately she started twitching. And I just knew that the moment I'd suggested that she started throwing all that stuff off the cliff, she was already throwing it. She had a great time. But that's like you say about the island. It isn't rigid. You don't have to follow the paths. Well, I think, you see, the reason I call it, it's like the reason I call it the cliffs is actually, I think, I don't care how anybody is. I've had two people say they didn't like the cliffs. Adam. I don't know how many loads, but I think my, uh, all of us have this liking for karma. Yeah. You know, if somebody, if some yobbo runs past you in the street, smacks you one round the head and runs off and runs into a nearest telegraph pole lamppost. Yeah. You laugh. Yeah. You think, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Your, in, <laughs> your inbuilt need for, for justice. There is it. And in, we all have it, you know, the, the guy that carves you up, uh, uh, heard of one on the radio the other day that this bloke was driving along in the fog and all of a sudden this idiot just came flying past him, carved him up. They went round a corner and he was sat in the ditch. Yeah. Because <laughs> probably hadn't seen it. And, and yeah. he, he just sort of like thought, yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, um, We have that and that's what the cliffs provides. It's more or less the only place on the island that it, well, perhaps the clinic protocol, but it's for those people that want actually a mild revenge yeah get that karma yeah going and um as i say I, i've had one or two people sort of say i couldn't throw my son off and i was sort of saying well does he stress you yeah he stresses the hell out of me i said well, you're not actually throwing him off you're throwing the effect of him off yeah i've had to explain that once or twice yeah. but um yeah we even get sort of sometimes events being turned into objects and thrown off yeah I get that with the um, with the, the the pebble in the blueprint when you say and if there's anything else on the beach that's etc etc the blueprints will know what we're talking about. Um, <clears throat> I've had people find all sorts. I've had people throw their wedding rings in, their wedding photographs. Um, I let somebody push a car in their car. Push a car in? Yeah, they push. It's their... not very environmentally friendly in my no. lake. <laughs> <laughs> they'd, have, they'd have probably driven it over the cliff if he'd been there first. Yeah. No, it was a guy, his girlfriend had cheated on him, and the car was bought with joint finance. That was his tie to, to her. Wow. And he said the car went in that car. I said, did anything else go in? Yeah, he said, I pushed my car in. And it was a nice Golf GTI. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, don't push it in. You could have just signed it across the beach. Yeah. <laughs> so... Is there anything else we want to cover on weight loss? I've kind of covered I been, everything that I do. My, I think we've been pretty well there. My, my weight loss is is three sessions. Um, from And from when I, when I follow up, I honestly can't remember the last time I had a client fail. So that's without, without these mythical gastric bands, without, um, without endless amounts of client education because as you said they already actually know you're just giving them a, just just give them a nudge in the right direction get the therapeutic bit right and the rest will follow but please follow it because it's such a great revenue stream weight loss is is i'd say probably 40 percent of my income 40 percent of my income realistically and the, here's the thing, it's easy money because you can charge really well for it. Um, so by charging really well for it, you attract the, the right demographic, you attract your professional clients. Your professional clients have got professional friends with professional relative incomes. So you're filling your diary. It's just great for your revenue stream. So go out there and do it. If you've got any questions other than are us to bar me, um, then feel free to ask. Shall we sign yeah, off? Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.